Okay, we're going to talk for just a quick couple of minutes about the abdominal aorta and we'll practice scanning it in lab, of course. We'll talk a little bit about the abnormal findings and how to incorporate this clinically. So reasons you might take a look at the aorta, uh, in at least in an acute or hospital setting, is patients with symptoms, right? Flank pain, back pain, maybe abdominal pain, or if they're in shock or cardiac arrest and you think uh, ruptured AAA may be part of the etiology. Maybe they also present with distal embolic phenomena or like leg ischemia or something like that. Remember the aorta is a retroperitoneal structure, so often their pain will be in their back or their flank. Sometimes aortic aneurysm rupture can mimic kidney stone. So any patient that's a little, you know, over say 50, if you're thinking about kidney stone, you should also be thinking about their aorta as well. Uh, imaging technique, mostly transverse. We're gonna do transverse views and follow it down. If we see something abnormal that we wanna further characterize, then we may need to do longitudinal views. But for our first look and for when it's normal, most of the time we just need transverse views and follow it down. Skipping over the normal, because again, we're gonna practice that and hopefully that's somewhere in your brain from earlier in the courses of med school. So abnormal really, it's just the question is, is it too big or not? Make sure you find your landmarks of the spine posteriorly with its shadow and then look for the aorta and decide if it looks to be enlarged or not and it should be less than two and a half centimeters in diameter. We measure from outer wall to outer wall. So if there's thrombus, we measure all the way past the thrombus to the walls of the aorta itself. And so two and a half centimeters is roughly the cutoff and it should taper as it courses distally. So pay attention to that as well. If we see something that's dilated or we think we see a flap, then maybe we get longitudinal views and get a little better look at that. Further examples, so here we see the spine back here with shadowing. Here's the abdominal aortic aneurysm, and notice we see some thrombus within here, but when we measure, we measure all the way out to the walls past the thrombus. We don't measure inside where the thrombus is. And here's just a longitudinal view. We see the spine behind it. These are abdominal aortic aneurysms. Uh, here we see an aorta with a flap that's moving during the cardiac cycle. So this is an aortic dissection. Aortic dissection we may find. There's high specificity for point of care ultrasound for aortic dissection not high sensitivity. So you can't truly rule out a dissection with point of care ultrasound, you may rule it in. And then we may have patients who are, have had post-operative things where they've got, uh, had an old aortic aneurysm and now they've got an aortoiliac graft in place and that's what this may look like. A few more examples of dissection. So here's a pretty obvious clear dissection. Again, it moves with the cardiac cycle here we're down pretty much at the iliac bifurcation. We can see this one involves both of the iliac vessels, so here and here, sitting over top of the spine. You see the spine here as well. Just quick couple of pearls, you know, push. You gotta push a fair amount, you gotta be a little bit patient. Stay vertical on the aorta. Sometimes having the patient exhale can help you. Make sure their, their arms are down at their sides, maybe have them bend their knees to relax those abdominal muscles. Make sure you see the whole thing. And as always, incorporate into the clinical context because people can be in shock and have an aortic aneurysm that's stable and is just an incidental finding. So make sure things make sense and add up in the whole clinical picture. Okay, let's spend a couple of quick minutes going over the kidneys. Again, hopefully a lot of this is review, but we'll talk a little bit about how to incorporate it clinically and what some of the pathologic findings are going to look like. Symptoms, so flank pain, hematuria, uh, acute kidney injury or uh, complicated urinary infections are all some of the reasons we might want to take a look at the kidneys and make sure there's not obstruction. And the most, the most important by far thing that we're going to look for finding is signs of obstruction, although we may see atrophy or masses or polycystic disease or other things as well. So we want to recognize those, but obstruction is by far the most important finding that we're going to look for in the you know, symptomatic patient. Again, not going to go over technique too much. We're going to practice that in hands-on. I want to just look at some examples of pathology and point out a couple of things. So one, remember fluid, and in the case of the kidney, most of the fluid we're talking about is urine. Urine that's um, backed up into the collecting system, that fluid is going to look black. And I wanted to point out also, and just as a reminder, that hydronephrosis dilating the collecting system is within the collecting system, so it's surrounded by some of the white tissues of the collecting system and it dilates those white tissues and then it may push out even further into the parenchyma but it's still generally 
going to be outlined by this white connective tissue from the renal collecting system. So that's how you can see hydronephrosis and obstruction. And remember, we fan through the kidneys completely. We don't just take a single picture. But the fluid is black. These are both cases of probably mild hydronephrosis. Just some other examples. And again, we see fluid dilating the collecting system here. So it's within the collecting system and dilating it. It's black. Uh, we can see the other landmarks look pretty good. This is again another, sometimes this is called the bear claw sign in the kidney where it's dilated. So just hydronephrosis, relatively straightforward as long as you get a decent image of the kidney and you fan through it and examine it completely. Further examples here, just lots of examples. Dilated renal pelvis, we see outline of white connective tissue from the renal pelvis. Another pretty mild example of hydronephrosis here. And then we always, every time you look at the kidneys, we should always look at both kidneys and the bladder. Sometimes the bladder can be distended and a cause of renal failure, and it may be more pronounced than the hydronephrosis you see in the kidneys themselves. So especially in the acute kidney injury patient where we're looking for signs of obstructive uropathy, look at both kidneys and look at the bladder as well. And the bladder Pretty straightforward if we know how to look for it during the FAST exam, this really just carries over into that as well. So here's what the bladder, we know what the bladder looks like. Point out as usual that it's not a perfect circle. If you see something that is a perfect circle in the pelvis, then you may be dealing with some other cystic structure. Once in a while, not very common, but on occasion we will see the stone right at the bladder neck in a patient with renal colic. And in that case, we've gone from a presumptive or speculative diagnosis and need some of these patients to a definitive diagnosis. So take a look for that. These are going to show up at the posterior walls towards the bladder neck. Once in a while you get lucky and you find them and you can you know, look like a rock star the rest of your colleagues. Just some other things to recognize. Uh, you may see polycystic kidney disease and there are occasions where you may be the first person who has seen this and diagnosed that in the patient. So You'll kind of see the whole kidney is obliterated with multiple cysts everywhere and sometimes it can be hard to tell if there's obstruction or not because this just obscures the anatomy. But want to recognize what that looks like and try to characterize it. And then you may see renal atrophy and there are some cases where patients with kind of long-standing kidney disease, you may have a really hard time finding their kidneys because it just gets swamped up in the rest of the retroperitoneal structures and really hard to find. But here's an example where you see it's, the kidney is small, the cortex is very thin, so this is an atrophied kidney. Things to keep in mind are that ultrasound does not definitively diagnose renal stones uh, on its own. So you take the history, the physical, the urine, use your brain along with the ultrasound to help you evaluate these patients. They can have stones and not have obstruction depending on their hydration status and size, character, location of the stone. And they can have hydronephrosis that is due to something else other than a stone. So again, use our brains, incorporate the information clinically. But if we put all the information together, and especially these acute kind of renal colic flank pain patients, we can be more selective with our CT scans. And I'll, my general guideline, and I'll give you the algorithm in a second, is really I only CT these people with acute flank pain if the diagnosis doesn't quite add up. So if the history of the physical, the urine, and the ultrasound don't all kind of point to kidney stone, and it points to me maybe there's something else going on, and I don't feel confident in the diagnosis, then then I'll do the CT scan. Their symptoms have gone on for a while, so if they've gone on for say a week or so, and now I'm thinking, all right, this stone maybe isn't gonna pass spontaneously, then I'll do the CT in that case. And if they have complications, so they look sick, they're febrile, their white count's high, uh, they've got uh, acute kidney injury with what I think is a kidney stone, then those are patients where it's a little more important to identify the size and location of that stone and there's a much higher likelihood of them needing intervention. But remember, most kidney stones, you know, 90% or so, pass spontaneously. And so in that 90%, CT scans don't really change the diagnosis, but they do increase cost, expose people to radiation. So what I generally say is save your CT for the second visit, unless there's some uncertainty or there are signs of complications. And here's just kind of that algorithm. You'd think maybe there's a kidney stone, history, physical, urine, ultrasound, if it all adds up, 
uh, and there are no complications, they don't look bad and their symptoms haven't gone on for a long time, then just manage their symptoms and tell them what to come back for, get them follow up. If it doesn't add up, it doesn't seem consistent with stone or there are signs of complications, then we probably need a CT scan. And I would even argue if that's the case, maybe we need to do it with contrast. Current generation and the timing that we do with contrast doesn't really interfere much with diagnosing stone itself. And if we're thinking there's some other complication, then the contrast may help us better define what's going on or what that complication is or the alternate diagnosis that may be going on. So that's kind of my algorithm. And then also just as a reminder, if you're thinking kidney stone, flank pain, and someone over 50-ish, then make sure you think about their aorta as well and probably just look at their aorta also because there may be a triple A. You may be able to see dissection, although you can't rule that out, okay? So that's pretty much it for the kidneys. Again, quick overview. We'll practice our technique, incorporate this to any patients with complicated UTI, acute kidney injury, or acute flank pain.